Hello and welcome everybody, King Dems back at it again and today we're going to be talking about G2 and their failure at the ESL Pro League. Now um, you can see in front of you, uh, let's just get rid of this so you can see the table, obviously G2 did not have a fantastic showing at ESL Pro League. Obviously there were some caveats, some reasons for this dip in performance. Overall, G2 have had a pretty decent start to the year. They got through their blast group. They performed pretty well at Katowice, obviously taking a top two. And came into ESL Pro League probably fairly confident in themselves. Now, unfortunately, come ESL Pro League, G2 did what G2 like to do, which is have a terrible performance almost out of nowhere. Um, out of nowhere is probably a little bit unfair because, like I say, there were caveats to their performance and we'll go into that. But if we just take a look um, at the results, this set of results is probably not good enough for a team of G2 standards. But we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, as we get to our first reason for their poor performance at this event. Now, obviously, losing your in-game leader, uh, Alexi B, to COVID just before the event is pretty disappointing. This meant that G2 had to hand over the in-game leading range to Nico, their star player, uh, which is obviously a not ideal scenario. Um, I think Big have suffered for the longest time from a similar problem where Tabson, one of their better players, has to in-game lead for them. It's not ideal when a player who you rely on to get a lot of the fragging done to carry a lot of the weight on your team Giving him further responsibilities in the form of in-game leading is not the best. It's obviously going to hit the individual performance to some degree. There are a few players out there who I think are exceptions to the rule where actually because they call the game around them, they're able to actually benefit from being an in-game leader. But I, I don't think Nico is one of those players. I think it's better when Nico is just honed in on being a carry force, being an individual player who gets frags, controls an area of the map. That's what you want from Nico, and obviously having him stand in as an eye in-game leader is not going to benefit that particularly. The other thing to note is the swap that they're making. Now, there's kind of two aspects that you can look at when you discuss this swap. Amanek coming in, in some senses, is actually quite a good stand-in to have because he knows the team very well, played for the team last year, has been in and around the team this year, obviously stood behind them at Katowice. When the coach Extaz was missing. So there's a lot of reasons when actually Amanek should be a pretty seamless addition. Slot him right in the roster. He knows the personalities and he knows the structure of the team. He understands the way the team works. So in a lot of ways, actually, this is a kind of perfect scenario for G2 to have somebody like Amanek to swap into the roster. On the other hand, Amanek is obviously not an in-game leader. He is... Not a fragging replacement either for Nico. You can argue that maybe Alexi B is not the maddest fragger. So bringing in Amanek, probably a better fragger overall than Alexi B. Not as good a fragger of Nico as Prime. But you can argue maybe, you know, the improvement of Amanek over Alexi B is enough to make up for the drop off in Nico's form. That's an argument to be had. But I think ultimately you can only look at this as something negative for G2. Losing your in-game leader is never an ideal scenario. Forcing your star player to replace that in-game leader is not an ideal scenario. So I think whatever, not positives, but potential mitigating factors there are to the substitution, i.e. there are arguments that kind of suggest that the substitution is not as big a deal as maybe you might think. Ultimately, it is definitely a an excuse to be quite frank for G2. They played three games here, the Looking for Org, the Mouse game, and the Fnatic game. They played without Alexi B. So yeah, they definitely have an excuse. They definitely have an asterisk they can pop next to this poor finish. The next problematic aspect that we have to discuss is the form of the star player, Nico. Now, yes, you can obviously make excuses. This Mouse and this Fnatic game, and the Looking for Org game, obviously, but they won that game and did fine. But these two games, it's a particularly poor showing uh, from Nico, especially by his standards. Obviously puts in a good performance on Inferno against Fnatic, but the rest is way short of what we expect of Nico, a top three player in the world. And whilst, yes, you can, again, put the asterisks next to these performances of 
he was in game leading at the time. If we look at some of his recent form in general, basically since the playoffs of Katowice, so we look at this Vertus Pro, this Na'Vi and this Phase series, it already wasn't great from Nico in these three series. For a normal player, this is perfectly fine and this is perfectly serviceable and I would not be criticizing, for example, Jax if he had these statistics. In fact, I'd probably be saying Jax is playing pretty well. The problem is, is you are Nico. Nico is supposed to be one of, if not the best player in the world. If we scroll down a little bit and we look at some of these numbers coming out of the group stage and just the start of the year in general, Nico was on an absolute tear at the start of the year and at the end of last year. We can carry it on into the end of last year. I mean, if you just look at the consistency and the high level of these ratings, the, the huge differentials, the regularity with which he's dropping 20, 25, 30 kills, Nico was having an incredible streak of form to end last year and to start this year. And he kind of, again, by his standards and by the standards he'd set himself, he fell off of a cliff in the Katowice playoffs and the wobbly form has kind of continued. We still see the odd flash of brilliance from Nico. Obviously this map against looking for org. Yes, admittedly a team that was playing their first game in pro league. They are an Australian team. They're not even the best team from the oceanic region. So I'm sorry, you don't get huge amounts of credit for a 1.54 against LFO, but Against Entropic, he was putting up a lot of the fight, particularly on this Dust 2 game. He was very, very good. However, you just can't argue that Nico's form has been pretty underwhelming as of late. If we just contrast that with Hunter's recent form, again, we'll start kind of from the playoffs of Katowice onwards, because that's when Nico dropped off. Actually, Hunter is the guy who by and large has stepped up and tried to fill Nico's shoes. Um, obviously huge performances against LFO. He was the best player for G2 pretty convincingly in the Katowice final. Like th this is really, really valiant stuff in defeat. 57 frags, dropping a 30 bomb on Dust2. There's not much more Hunter can be doing in some of these games to fill the gap left by Nico. Here in the map win against Fnatic, he's carried G2 to that map win. He absolutely ruffle stomp nip. He was going ham in this series, putting on an absolute clinic. And yeah, he still has had maps which have not been good, was pretty poor in the Entropic series. And actually, if Hunter had been living up to his recent general form in this series against Entropic, maybe G2 would have gotten over the line because Nico actually was pretty good in this series. So, But my point is, if we just... Let's just have a look here. If we have a look at this, actually Hunter has on average been a little bit better. And you can just see this without running the numbers. If I just keep kind of swapping back and forth for you here, it's pretty obvious that he has been the better of the two players overall. And considering Nico is supposed to be one of the best players in the world, whereas Hunter is supposed to be, you know, like a, a regular top 20 entry, but he's never probably going to break top five. It's a little bit frustrating, I think, to see these numbers if you're a G2 fan. I'm, you know, going to keep doing it. But I think it just emphasizes you're seeing more of the red from Nico. You're not seeing as many standout carry performances as you are from Hunter. You're not seeing 1.71s and 2.05s from Nico at the moment. You know, his best rating still, like, very good around the one high 1.4s, 1.5s. But, again, not getting up to these heights. Even a 1.58 is is ahead of what Nico's putting been putting in recently. It's not a disaster per se, but just again, by the high standards Nico sets for himself and for the level that we expect of a player like Nico, he has been underwhelming, a little bit wobbly, short of his best in the last month or so. The final important reason that I think G2 struggled at EPL, and I think it this is probably the biggest systematic issue within this team right now. I think if they can get this issue fixed, they will be a top three team in the world for the foreseeable future. And it's their map pick. They are really, really struggling to find a good map pick. Now, at EPL, and we can have a little look at this here. Just take a little look at, at the map. So they're losing lots of Dust2. They actually picked Dust2 twice here. So these two Dust2s are actually picks from G2. G2 picked this map, lost it both times. That is an issue. If you're going to be losing your map pick regularly, you're going to struggle to be a consistent team. This is not 
okay. You need to find a map that you can reliably pick and reliably win. Now, obviously, if you look at this and you say, right, well, the Dust 2 played 6, 33. Yeah, Dust 2 is not working. We should not be picking it. Let's look for a dis different map. Mirage is the map they've played the second most, only a 50% win rate on it, not super convincing, but it's Alexi B's favourite map. He's pretty much made this map the home map for all of the teams he's led. The problem is, if you look at their Mirage stats, so they picked Mirage once here at Pro League against Maus, and they lost it. And then back at Katowice, Mirage, they picked it five times, and they lost it three. So they picked it here, lost it. Picked it here and picked it here, won it both times. Look, pick and a loss, pick and a loss. So that's three picks and losses, two picks and wins. Not good enough. Need to be doing better. Probably can't really have Mirage as you pick. The map that actually is doing G2 the best is Inferno. So if we look at their last two tournaments, they picked Inferno against Nip and won it pretty solidly. They picked Inferno against Looking for Org and won it. I think we do have to put a caveat next to that in that these were two relatively low stakes games. Looking for Org, they were comfortable favourites, should never be losing this game. And against Nip in the decider on, of the group, I call it a decider. That's a bit of a misnomer because there was nothing being decided by this game. Nip already were topping the group. A loss didn't mean anything. It wouldn't have even affected their seeding. They were always going to top the group. And G2 were always out. There was no way G2 could get through to playoffs. So this game was meaningless dead rubber. You can't really read too much into it. So the two Inferno picks and wins. Yes, it's a good sign. You're picking the map. You're winning it. And if we go back to Katowice, they actually picked Inferno once at Katowice, I believe, in this series. Let's just check that. Yeah, so G2 picked Inferno once and it was against uh, Na'Vi and they won it. So the times in recent memory that they've picked Inferno and even a lot of time they've played Inferno in general, they have won it. They have a couple of losses on it. Yes, like they have the uh, loss to Fnatic and they have the loss obviously to FaZe on it, but they were both reasonably close games. I think this Fnatic loss was a bit bizarre. They spanked Fnatic in the first map 16-2 and then went on to lose the next two. Bit of a bizarre game. It was the opener of Katowice. Yeah, I don't know. It felt like it was a map that maybe was bucking the trend rather than kind of proving any sort of point. Basically, if I'm G2, um, I'm 100% looking to make Inferno our home map. Like, I think it's a no-brainer. It's the map that they are consistently playing very well. It's the map that when they pick it, they win it the most. Mirage is a real, real problem. Um, I, I don't think they should be picking Mirage at all. And Dust 2 is definitely not worth a pick in general. I think Dust 2, Vertigo, Ancient, these are maps I would not be picking. I think Dust 2 and Vertigo and Ancient are all difficult to pick because it's not easy to have a consistent T side on it. I think these are the problems with these three maps and... Yeah, I don't think you want to be picking any of the three of them as your home map if you can possibly avoid it. It can be a punish pick. It can be something that you are comfortable on and are willing to pick in a series if needed to, you know, basically try and win the veto. But yeah, Dust 2 as a home map, not feeling it. The stats are not bearing out on it. Let's get rid of Dust 2. Mirage, again, think it can be within your map pool. But again, I don't think it should be the home map I would be making Inferno our home map if I'm G2. It seems to be the map we are most consistent on. It seems to be the map that we win the most when we actually pick it. Let's keep picking Inferno. Let's keep getting better at that map. And Alexi B, let's just, let's just chill. The love affair with Mirage. Let's chill it out, bro. There's other fish in the sea, all right? There's other maps. Play them. Pick them. Win them. That's it from me, guys. Just a quick one on G2 and their recent struggles. Um, I will also probably be looking to do a VOD review of the G2 Entropic. Probably not the whole series. I'll probably pick a map from it, but we'll see. Um, basically, to delve in a little bit more on the gameplay side of things and see where G2 faltered in what was the kind of key series in their ESL Pro League run. You know the draw, guys. If you've got videos you want to see in the comments, like it. Comment anyway. You know, even if you don't have a suggestion, just comment. Just tell me, just tell me, say hi. Say hi, what's up, Demps? And I'll be like, hi, what's up, bro? Good to see you. And if you didn't like it, 
if you didn't like it. I'm watching you. <laughs>